Welcome to Menopause, Marriage and Motherhood, a podcast that's all about changing the way we view midlife and bringing the conversation about menopause out into the open. Each week we share stories, experiences and inspiration. We talk to experts on how to best navigate this time of life and find out how other people have not only survived but thrived through this time. I'm your host, Karen O'Connor. Hello and welcome. Today I'm here with Liz Ward. Welcome, Liz. Thank you for having me. You are, oh, look, I'm so glad to have you here. So Liz is a registered dietitian nutritionist from Boston, Massachusetts, and co-author of the Menopause Diet Plan and Natural Guide to Managing Hormones, Health and Happiness. She and a co-author, fellow registered dietitian nutritionist Hilary Wright, are passionate about helping women feel and look their best during the transition to menopause and after menopause. They write about what they know. Both are postmenopausal women who are experts in women's health, and they blend science-based information with practical advice. So I'm going to go back to what we just said before I press the record button and not the stop mm-hmm. button. You were saying about difference between, was it managing your weight? How is it you put it? Because you put it really well. I said well. weight gain or lack of oh weight management uh, control that happens at midlife, I think. And that, that made you laugh. So it did um, make me laugh. Like, oh my goodness. Yeah. The penny dropped then because yeah. you can carry on eating the same things that you've always eaten in the same amounts. And then you hit menopause and you're like, you wake up one morning, you go, where's that jelly belly come from? It's going yeah. on. You do. It does seem like you wake up one morning and say, Hey, I didn't used to have a belly where I now have a belly. Um, but it it really did take time to accumulate. It's just, <laughs> you just kind of notice it one day. <laughs> yeah. Just got that little bit bigger one day where you went, mm-hmm. oh, hang on. <laughs> yeah, right. Where you say, uh-uh, what's going on? So talk to me about that then. Well, let's come at this from that perspective. Let me go back a little bit. How did you end up as a nutritionist? Tell me a little bit about your journey into nutrition oh. and then you your movement into specializing in menopause and postmenopause. Oh, my journey. Let's see. I can remember as a teenager watching a show about cancer and diet and being completely enthralled by it. That food had that much power that it it really was very helpful in these cancer patients. And then that got me more and more interested. Plus I was an athlete in high school. I was a gymnast. And of course we were always told, you know, you need to lose weight, which back in the eighties was okay to say to people, athlete, uh, high school age girls, that it was apparently okay to make them lose weight. But so I was interested in nutrition from that standpoint too. And then Um, When I went to college, I just, I wasn't kind of undecided, but then I just really went for it. And I just love women's health always because I'm a woman and I thought, wow, how does nutrition affect me? And I wrote a pregnancy book on when I was on maternity leave with my first child, I wrote a pregnancy nutrition book. And then I veered even more into women's health. And so I really believe that you should write what you know. If you're going to be giving advice, write what you know. So as Hillary and I went through life, we went to college together. We met in college in organic chemistry uh, lab, and we moved through life together. We live in the same area. We're both registered dietitians. We both have three children. She has three boys. I have three girls. We both went through menopause. We're the same age. And we finally said, you know, at this point in our lives, let's do something together because we had never work together. We'd gone to school together, obviously. And that's how the menopause book came about. Yeah, we we felt like we really had something to say. And and we said it. So how does menopause impact the way your body processes food and what kinds of foods it needs? Oh, in so many ways. You know, beginning in your 40s when you start with the menopause you know, perimenopause, which we also call the menopause transition, because all of this is a transition, you start to need more protein, fewer refined carbohydrates, your calorie margins, as Hillary and I like to say, narrow, which means there's not enough, not enough, right, not a lot of room for extra calories. So you may have gone through your day picking at this and maybe having an extra serving of that, 
and nothing really ever happens with your weight. But as you start to lose muscle mass in your 40s, your metabolic rate goes down. So you need to eat differently, not radically differently, but you need to kind of reset, reconsider what you're doing and take a hard look at where you're spending your calories because we all have a calorie allotment and it changes as we roll through life. And age is one of the reasons why our calorie allotment goes down. But really age is mainly, when I say age, I really mean because we're losing muscle mass, we're losing muscle tissue. And if we keep that built up and preserve it as much as possible, we're going to preserve our metabolic rate as well. So there's a lot going on starting around age 40. By the time you hit 50, that's where you may you know, wake up one day and say, what the heck happened to my body? Where did it go? But really, it's been you've been working on that for about 10 years. So why do we lose muscle as we age? It's just a fact of aging. You know, it happens to men too. So I know, you know, we have a tendency to blame so many things on menopause, but much of it is age. You know, it's really hard to tease out in the research what, you know, how much weight gain or attributable to menopause itself versus aging. Because if you look at middle-aged men and their, you know, pot bellies, um, you can see that uh, fat tends to accumulate around the abdomen in men and women as we get older. And it's just a fact of life. I think the question is maybe not why does it happen so much as what should we do about it? The thing that differentiates weight gain after 50 uh, from maybe weight gain at 25 or 20 is that it does tend to accumulate around the abdominal area. And so there's so much talk about belly fat in menopause. And, you know, people just want to get women just want to get rid of that belly fat. Well, it can happen, but you just have to approach it the same way you would any type of weight loss. Okay, so there's not a, because you see all these ads for lose the belly weight now. That's yeah. kind of not true. It's- well, it doesn't mean it won't happen. But a lot of those headlines are kind of predatory, right? Because, you know, as a, a woman who's gained weight in her belly, you may feel very vulnerable, or you may be vulnerable, you may not even know that, you know, these quick fix promises um, are fake, you know, in the long run, you may shell out a lot of money for a solution to your problem, who doesn't want a solution to their problem, we all do. The, it, the, the problem is that doesn't come quickly, you know, that you that what you really have to do from now on is to, you know, as I said, take a look at what you're eating, just change your diet a little bit and you will get results that will last. You know, why give these hucksters or the money that for stuff that doesn't work? So as women hit menopause, interpolating here, so we've got a double whammy as opposed to men because we've got the, the aging thing, which happens naturally. And then we've also got the change in hormones thing. Right. right. How? Because that's going to be really difficult to distinguish between the two things isn't it like okay this is this is going to happen anyway and then you got this and how do we deal with that what talk me through that side of things you know it's just as I was saying before just so difficult even in the research to tease out you know which how much of it is hormonal so as you you know get closer to your 50s you are experiencing more dips, a roller coaster ride, let's just say, with your estrogen levels. And that is what is causing the belly fat to accumulate around your abdomen, although no one knows exactly why. I mean, that's just an association that's being made. But it certainly happened to me, I gained 10 pounds. And I thought, I'm a dietitian. What do you mean? I wrote a book here. Why am I gaining weight? Because it happens to people. Uh, and, but again, we st- Hillary and I still couldn't figure out what percentage can be blamed on your estrogen levels. I guess the thing to do maybe would be to do a study of women that are on hormone replacement therapy and compare them to others that aren't and see, are there any changes um, in terms of weight? Um, that would be a complicated you know, study to do. But all I can say is that all of us are losing lean muscle tissue with at an appreciable pace around age 40, starting at age 40. It really does start around age 30, but 
with at a significant pace in age 40. And it's one of those things, it's like, you know, spending too much money and then realizing you're out of money, you know, at the end of, you know, five or six or seven years. It's just a little bit every year extra. So you just need losing a little bit of muscle every year um, in your 40s. And you might be eating a little bit more. And then, you know, by the time you're 50 or 51, and, and you really, which is the average age of menopause um, in many countries, you really are stuck with more body fat than maybe you wanted. But again, I'm not really sure that all of that can be blamed on on menopause. It's funny you saying that because I remember I had a personal trainer a little while ago and I was really shocked that the BMI actually decreases as you age because your lean muscle mass, I don't know whether I've said that right, but your lean muscle mass is less. So a healthy BMI is actually goes down. So it's not the 21 point something. It should actually be less than that if you've got the, <laughs> if you want the same amount of body fat. I know because I've trained my whole life. I'm still fit and I'm still healthy. Mm-hmm. But I was shocked that I was on the border between healthy weight and overweight on yeah. for my age range. I'm, I was just like, no, hang on a minute. I know, <laughs> said, I know. But you've lost I your muscle. Can't lose your muscle. It's something that we harp on a lot in the mm-hmm. book. I mean, we devote an entire chapter to exercise in general, but weight training and, and other resistance training, and then coupling that with adequate protein intake, because that is the thing that I find is, and I don't know how it is there, but in the U S I don't think women eat enough protein and they certainly don't eat enough protein after 50. And the research says that as we get older, we need more protein to, you know, build, we can build muscle like a 30 year old or a 25 year old. We just need more protein to do it. So you can't expect to be lifting weights or, you know, doing bands three times a week and and getting muscle if you don't also provide your body with the raw material, which is the protein found in foods to build that muscle. That's really interesting because I was a swimmer when I was younger. So I mm-hmm. was just carbohydrates, you know, because <laughs> of the swimming training. <laughs> yeah. And then when I was probably in my early 40s, it started switching to more protein. And then in my yeah. 50s, it really went much more heavily protein based and not mm-hmm. so many carbs. And I did right. try the keto diet for a while. And my body, I could do it. Uh, I think for about nine months, I reckon. And then my body just went, no, you need more carbs. (laughs) So I kind of introduced more carbs again, but I have noticed that I'm a meat and vegetables kind of person now, whereas Mm -hmm. I never was when I was younger. But it's interesting you saying that because I didn't make the connection between meat or protein and muscle mass. It's like, okay, right, that makes sense now. There's a big connection, um, even in swimmers. Now, I think we know a lot more about swimmers. I mean, we want them to build their muscle as well. Of course, they need a lot of fuel, and the fuel is the <laughs> carbohydrates and the fat. But that's going to provide a lot of calories. Uh, but you know, things do change as you get older. Your taste changes. Your attitude about food changes. You may like more foods now than you did when you were a kid, or or even in your 20s and 30s. And I found exactly the same. I eat way fewer carbs than I used to, but I'm not an, on a no carb diet or even a low carb diet, but I pick and choose wisely. You know, it's what we call nutrient rich foods. I don't need to eat four or five or six cookies like I used to. I mean, I would just down them and just be, you know, done with it because you had a faster metabolism. Now it's like, well, I'll have one or two because that's really all I can spare. You start to know where your body's at and you start to know what you can spare in terms of extra uh, calories and really what, what your taste preferences are. You may, you, know, you may find that you feel better by eliminating chips and sweets um, and things like that and alcohol and you just feel better, so you go with it. In terms of what you should eat, like we we keep hearing about, oh, don't eat sugar, don't eat too many fats, don't eat mm-hmm. too many carbs, don't eat, you know, I'm gluten intolerant, so don't eat anything with, with wheat in it. Mm-hmm. What, in general, what 
are the the better for, because the other thing for me is my body really doesn't like soy so that puts a lot of vegetarian foods out because tofu's out tempeh's out because yeah. tempeh's wheat yeah. based and and this is all as I'm getting as I went through menopause all of a sudden my body just mm. went no you're not eating any of that stuff <laughs> and it's yeah. though it's grains and legumes mm-hmm. are just grains hardly at all legumes small doses but not soy and <clears throat> nuts are the other things that my body's decided it doesn't like to process oh. too much and that was literally oh. as I went through menopause more and more things started dropping off what is that all about is that just your body I don't know I mean that's you're a complicated case <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, things definitely change. Your gut changes in menopause. It gets slower. You may feel more constipated. You know, you may just have more bloating. Also, as you, you know, again, we're trying to separate out what's going on with age and what's going on with menopause. But as we all get older, our immune system also declines ever so slightly. And, you know, most of your immune system in is in your gut. So if your gut's changing, your immune system's not doing maybe as well as it should, and maybe you found you're allergic to something all of a sudden. So again, I mean, there's just so many different possible reasons, but it's hard to say for you as you get older. I mean, I've developed reflux. That was something that I didn't have in my 40s, but I have it now in my 50s. Is that Age is that menopause. It's again, it's really tough to sort it all out. And as Hillary and I like to say, this is like it's like a perfect storm of factors. You know, they're coming together, swirling out around in this in the stormy waters, and you're like, okay, how is this gonna turn out? Like, what is this gonna where is this gonna lead me? And you you don't always know, but you just have to roll with it and and be knowledgeable about what you what you should be doing in a in the most basic way is going to be really helpful. So you need to avoid gluten and legumes, but the next person may not need to do that. Our basic rules, the menopause diet plan is like a mashup of the DASH diet plan and the Mediterranean style of eating. It's plant-based, but not animal food free. It's higher in protein than either one of those, you know, eating plans, because I mentioned protein is so important. It's low in refined carbs, but not low in carbohydrate. And it's moderate in alcohol. If not, I mean, we can talk about alcohol, but we don't suggest that you drink. But if you want to drink, we have guidelines. Again, not that we invented, but from reputable organizations. I think about getting a lot of the junk out from our standpoint. I think you're just kind of cleaning house in a way and really saying, what can I do without? How can I, can I do with one glass of wine instead of two? Can I maybe have cocktails on one night of the week instead of, you know, two? Uh, do I, do I need those chips? Do I really need them? So mindful eating as well, I think plays a big role. So there's no like should or shouldn't. I mean, we say that the only food you have to avoid are the ones that you're allergic to or otherwise are dangerous for you or uncomfortable, right? There's really no good or bad foods. There's foods that you should really consume most of the time and then other foods that you should have every once in a while but nothing is off the table so talk to me about those two diets and explain to me because the dash diet i've kind of vaguely seen once or twice i think i know what the mediterranean diet is but talk to me about those two and and let's just go through that and why plant-based a couple of reasons i mean both the mediterranean diet and the dash diet which is stands for dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. So that was designed to limit high blood pressure and just kind of stop it in its tracks and it works. And it is plant-based and so is the Mediterranean style of eating because plants don't have cholesterol. They really, very few of them have saturated fat. They don't really have any appreciable amounts of sodium unless you do all sorts of things to them and add sodium and fry them and whatnot. But also the DASH diet has nuts in it on a regular basis and also dairy products. And dairy products have potassium in them. They have magnesium, they have calcium. All of these minerals, all of these components together lower blood pressure. They also 
support bone health, lower the risk for heart disease, lower the risk for stroke. So it kind of started out as high blood pressure, but then the subsequent studies that were done with it just found so many benefits. So there's no diet that we talk about. There's not one for bone health, not one for brain health, not one for heart health. They're all just one way of eating, which makes it so convenient. And then the Mediterranean style of eating, that's not a diet at all. That's just all the countries that surround the Mediterranean. They have not the same diet, of course. Italy, the Italians don't eat the same way as the the Spaniards do. But what's the common denominator there? Lots of plant foods. Seafood is a common denominator, which we highly recommend. Butter, no. Olive oil, yes. Things like that. So both of those plants were you know, low in saturated fat, low in added salt, but delicious plant-based ways of eating that we kind of put together and then enhanced based on research about protein and made them a little bit higher in protein. And how did you come to put those two together? What made you go, oh, that one and that one? Well, we're just big fans of both of them. We wanted to create our own way of eating for women over 50 based on what we knew from a lot of different research. So as I said, it's a mashup really of the two with that extra added the protein to help build and preserve muscle because we didn't think that the other two had enough. Well, weight, just- weight is always a big one. It's just really an issue that drives so many other issues too. Um, And I know women have lots of problems with weight control and lots of concerns. I can just tell you that losing like, I, okay, like I said, I gained 10 pounds and I was rattled. I mean, I didn't like it, but I've lost maybe five or six. Um, It's taken me a really long time to do it. But even just losing just half of that is good for my health. So we really don't need to be thinking that we're going to get back to our 25 year old bodies, especially at If we've had children, no, nobody is going back to their 25 year old body unless there's a lot of surgery and Botox and liposuction, getting rid of the fat involved. It's not going to happen. And even if it does, your body is just still not what it was when you were 25, but that's okay. So don't, you know, beat yourself up about not looking like you did when you were 25. Just focus on energy. You know, how do I eat to feel more energetic? How do I eat to reduce the risk of heart disease, you know, cancer, stroke, because we're all getting older, and we have to think about it that way. And men have to do it too. They just don't have that extra added menopause thing on top of it all. (laughs) I think that's actually why I got a bit lost there, because the weight problem thing has has not come into my life. I've been fortunate enough. I don't have a sweet tooth and I've exercised my whole life. I have a father who he's 83 and he still looks like Action Man, you know, a skinnier (laughs) version of Action Man, but he's still really fit. So that's been my guide. I'm Mm -hmm. just like, okay, I'll stay fit because that's where I am in my family. I'm going to say where I am in my family. My brother's not. Uh He's the complete opposite. So, okay. So I kind of struggle with the weight loss side of things because mine is tweaking as opposed to I've got a weight problem. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I don't think about it. So I've got to apologize right there because I didn't even think about it. But obviously it is a big problem because people women do get to menopause, men do get to midlife and they just balloon all of a sudden. And it might have been something that they haven't had a problem with before. I need you to talk me through this because I don't know. No, I think you've, 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 you've brought up a good point. And the point is really, I think habits, you're blessed with not having a sweet tooth. I have a sweet tooth. So I, I know that you're a very, very lucky woman because trying to tame mine is just really awful uh, most of the time, but I managed to do it. So, but, you know, really developing good habit is a good idea. And it's not easy, especially if you've pretty much gone through life and you've been thin. You know, there are women that relatively thin, had a great fast metabolism and then put on weight in their fifties and they don't know what to do about it because they've never had a weight issue. They've, or they've never developed exercise, you know, habits on a regular basis to kind of build the muscle or even to strengthen themselves cardiovascular wise. And it's all new to them. 
it's like new terrain. And then there are women who have struggled with their weight all their lives. And this is just an extra added burden once they get into the 50. But what you said about developing good habits, you can start anytime you want. You know, you're lucky that you had that role model in your dad. My mother was 92 when she died and she was my role model. I mean, she was an incredible ager. You know, she did everything in her power to remain active physically and mentally. And I think, you know, if we can find a person like that in our lives and just model ourselves after them, if possible, could be anybody, we should do it because um, we're all going to get older. This is not going to not happen. It's happening. And, you know, how do you want it to happen? In the U.S., you can live up to 40%. A woman can live up to 40% of her life after menopause. What are you going to do about it? Are you just going to say, oh, I'm going to gain weight and that's that? Don't, because it affects your health. I'm not saying it from an appearance um, point of view. I'm talking about your energy, your heart disease risk, your cancer risk, what it's doing to your joints, putting a lot of pressure on your joints. So feel better, make a few changes and focus on how you feel, not, oh, I have to get this 20 or 30 pounds off. It'll come off. That's a good point, actually, because I think that's one of the things that I've always done instinctively. How does this make me feel? Do I feel good when I've eaten that? And that's kind of carried me through. Right. As opposed to, I like the taste of this because I've got to say, <laughs> I think I would have had a sweet tooth, except I was so, I, I suspect I had oppositional defiance disorder. So because everybody else likes sweet things, I went, no, I'm not doing that. Oh, <laughs> God, I wish I had myself. that disorder. I really do. <laughs> yeah. I think I have that with salty foods. You know, some people love Did sweets. You? Some people love salt. I yeah. could care less about salty foods, so. Isn't it interesting? interesting. What do you think is the most important thing for midlife women, women going through menopause, postmenopausal women? What is the most important thing that you want them to know? So the most important thing is that this is a transition. If it's bad and it's full of hot flashes and mood swings and other uncomfortable things happening to you, just know that it won't last. It doesn't last. There is an end to it. And to really do your best to understand from credible sources what is happening to your body and not go for any sort of quick fix solutions. Because from a diet and nutrition standpoint, there aren't. I'm not talking about medications to treat anxiety and depression or hormone replacement therapy, because that's not my lane. I don't talk about that. But I'm saying from a lifestyle standpoint, it will likely get better. You really want to make sure that you are eating and exercising properly, because you want to stay healthy and energetic for the rest of your life. It's interesting what you say about quick fixes, because the pennies just dropped for me with that, because a Mm. quick fix essentially makes you lose weight immediately. But what you're trying to do with the nutrition is change your gut health so that your body becomes healthier and loses the weight naturally. Is that, have I got the right end of the stick there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, gut health is one issue for sure. And let's take that for example. Women, I know in the US, I don't know about in Australia, they don't get enough fiber. And it's been identified as one of the nutrients of concern in our dietary guidelines, meaning that we don't get enough fiber from childhood on. And that really affects your gut health. Sure, I mean, getting more fiber. But again, where do you get fiber? from plant foods, which goes back to what I was saying about why plant foods are so wonderful. So really, I'm talking also about eating to support your bone health, your brain health, your heart health, reduce your risk of cancer, all the things that you need to do to help yourself stay well. So talk to me through because I think the difference between what you're saying and what most people do, I think we're brought up to eat to feel good Mm -hmm. as opposed to being um, feel good emotionally and mentally as opposed to feeling good physically there's a difference isn't there and the physical one is the longer term one because that impacts your your emotions and everything but there's an instant react I think that's what I'm trying to get at that instant same with the diets you know those lose weight fast diets are the same thing it's that quick fix thing isn't it as opposed to do it slowly and and do it better 
Is that right? Well, it's, yeah, it's instant gratification on both counts. Eating chocolate for me is like, wow, you know, wow. I mean, I just love it. Ice cream. Oh, give it to me. You know, chocolate chip cookies. Love them. Instant gratification. I feel so good immediately because it's activating pleasure part of your brain. Your brain says, I remember you, you give me pleasure and it's fleeting. Well, I mean, it doesn't last forever. And the same thing with these get thin quickly types of eating programs, you go through them and they're, but they're painful. I mean, there's no pleasure there, but at the end, you know, you feel okay. Like, Hey, I lost five pounds. I feel better, but that doesn't last either. The weight always comes Back. And the only way you can keep the weight off is by changing what you put into your body on a long term basis. That is for sure. That is true. In addition to moving around more, to building muscle, yeah, what you eat on a long term basis will not only affect your weight, but it will affect your nutrition status and your bones and your brain and your heart and the rest of your body. Give me the three most important things in your view that you okay. want to get from your nutrition during okay. and after menopause. They're two different things as well, aren't they? During and um, after, are not they? So much, not, not mm. so much. So the three most important things would be to find the calorie level that works for you, either to maintain your weight or to lose it, uh, to lose some of it, not all of it. Make sure that you're exercising so that you're building and maintaining muscle tissue so that you keep your metabolism running in high gear. And, you know, thirdly, we didn't really talk about this, but reducing your stress and getting enough sleep. Those are things that also pertain to your weight and your health. Sleep in menopause. <laughs> I know. I always feel awful when I bring up sleep. And you know, Hillary and I feel the same way. It's like trying to tell a menopausal woman that she should sleep more is just, it's just awful. But there are things that you can do to try to sleep better, which would be go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time every day or try to. No screens in the bedroom whatsoever. Do something relaxing before you go to bed so that you are kind of inching towards getting more sleep. And then, you know, trying to you know, speak to your doctor if night sweats, hot flashes at night are really affecting your sleep and also cool the room off. If you know, my husband thinks we sleep in the Arctic because it's really, really cool in our bedroom. <laughs> yeah, mine does too. He's like, can we close the window? <laughs> no. Yeah, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> put another blanket on you'll be it's fine right. who, who had the kids I had the kids and now I'm, <laughs> now you're paying for it <laughs> yeah absolutely because yeah. that is the hardest for me that was the hardest thing the lack of yeah. sleep um, and I think one nobody warned me about it mm -hmm. but the other thing for me when I was going through it and I started going through menopause about 10 years ago, nobody really, it's not something that was spoken about. And I'd go to the doctor and she'd go, oh, you'll be all right in a few years. Here's some uh -huh. antidepressants, have some sleeping tablets, come back yeah. to me in five years if you're not okay. <laughs> How does that help? And okay. also the, the number of people who don't realize I remember I had I was interviewing a guy who specializes in health and well-being for our age range you know and he said you know the three most important things are what you eat your fitness level and sleep and mm -hmm. I went okay so what do you do about sleep during menopause and he said he didn't know what I was talking about he had no clue that women who go through menopause <laughs> have an issue with sleep and I thought, uh -huh. well, you can't sleep half the time, you know. If you get right. four hours a night broken sleep, you're really lucky sometimes. Right. And that goes it's on like, for years. It's like having infants all over again, right? Yes. Where you just yes. are just so tired during the day and you can't think. The other thing that interrupts you know, sleep at this point in our lives is, you know, all the different situations that we're in. You know, for example, we may be caring for an elderly parent or two while there are children children still at home are going off to college, we may have financial difficulties because we're coming into a retirement age. You know, there's so many different things that are going on all at the same time that may affect your ability to sleep, not just hot flash. It's again, that perfect storm rolling around in your head at night. 
And if you can't think straight, you know what, you know, if you can't think very well during the day, what are you doing? You may be reaching for more caffeine, let's say, because you're trying to you know, stay awake and function. You have a job, you have a household to manage, you have a business to run, and you have to be awake. And so then you get so wound up. And then if you've had a bad day, well, maybe you'll have a glass of wine. Well, guess what? That interrupts your sleep. It affects your ability to sleep deeply. So it's just this cycle that so many women can get into. And all you can do is try your best, you know, see your way through it with armed with all the information possible, not just being brushed off by your doctor or anybody else that's caring for you. And if that's happening, you know, you could get another doctor, but you could also, you know, really delve into it on your own and figure out what to do. Thank you for that, Liz. I think it's time for us to finish up there. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure.